Yeah, 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 I will, I will. Thank you. All right, well, I think we'll go ahead and get started then. So we'll just begin with a, with a, with a prayer, uh, remembering in a special way that today is the feast day of the Most Holy Trinity. And we begin today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy Lord, I simply want to uh, thank you for having provided us this day, a new day of opportunities, a new day of life, and a new day to live alongside you, to work alongside you, and to worship alongside you. Lord, thank you for all of your blessings, most especially the gift and the opportunity that you offer us for salvation through your holy sacraments, and most especially in the greatest of all the sacraments, the Holy Eucharist, your literal and physical body, blood, soul, and divinity. Lord, as we come together today as one holy Catholic apostolic people, help us to know you, to love you, and to serve you. And in a special way, as we learn today of this most beautiful gift that you have given your holy Catholic Church of the Eucharist, help us to grow ever more in love with you, to mimic and to mirror, even in a small way, the great love and mercy that you bestow upon us. We ask all this through the intercession of the Holy Virgin Mary and of St. Joseph. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, thank you all very much, my friends. So today, uh, this little retreat that my dad and I are offering, my dad will begin by going through the biblical foundations of why it is we, as a Catholic people, hold to this truth of the Eucharist as being the literal body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, I felt it important for us to look through the biblical foundation of it because uh, so many of our Protestant brothers and sisters, they have a deep love and reverence of the Scriptures. And if we are to be able to speak with them, we should be able to speak the language that they adopted from us to begin with. My friends, uh, everything that the church teaches, everything that the church holds, it is found in sacred scripture. The only thing is, sometimes it's not as straightforward as we in our modern day American society would like. Uh, so my dad is going to go through the biblical foundations, um, and I will go afterwards uh, explaining a bit about the history of the development of the belief of the Eucharist and how we as a Catholic people worship the Eucharist throughout history. And so in order to get as much, uh, as much of a benefit as we can today, we're going to go ahead and start. And so here is Father's father, Juan Hernandez. Good afternoon, everyone. I've introduced myself already. Uh, I'm Father Alex's father, and as you can see, I have a strong accent. I'm a hillbilly from Puerto Rico, so you have to combine that with my accent. Please, I know this is a hard time for everybody after lunch. It's the time that everybody would like to have a nap. If you fall asleep, don't worry. We will take a picture of you, and we put it on the Facebook. Okay. Everything that I'm going to talk today, I'm going to synthesize this just in 45 minutes. I used to do this all weekend long. It's the all weekend retreat. Started Friday all the way to Sunday. So what I'm going to take is just little pieces of here and there to try to make more sense to you what is about the Holy Eucharist. If any of you know exactly when was the first, actually the first mass redacted on the Bible, in the Bible, the first mass, where, where we can point the first mass in the Bible? Hmm? 
Ok, camino, em, eh, the road to Emmaus. Yeah. Well, no, in the Old Testament, already we find trace of the Holy Eucharist. Back then, in the Old Testament, they have two types of sacrifice. One was the sacrifice for the sin, and the other sacrifice was of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, that's what the Holy Eucharist means. We used to say the word mass, but mass don't mean what you think it is. If I ask you what mass means for you, you will relate it with the Holy Eucharist. But in reality, the word mass comes from Latin that means go forward. That's what mass means, go forward. The first reduction of this sacrifice of Saint giving was with Melchizedek, with Abraham, with bread and wine. That was the first connection from the Old Testament there. I'm not going to read through the Bible everything because we never get out of here then. Okay? And I'm going to briefly tell you the whole story without using the Bible in order to get as much as we can in these 45 minutes. But at the end, if anyone is interested in the verse of the Bible, I will be more than glad to give it to you. Separate, okay? So that, that's to combine better the time what uh, we have here. Do you remember in the Old Testament when the people of God was in the desert with manna? You remember the story. Everybody's connected to that with the manna. Do you have any idea what manna means? Huh? We relay like a manna means bread of, of, from heaven, right? Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. What manna means is, what is this? That's a Hebrew word that means, what is this? Because they have no idea what they were seeing. That's what manna means, what is this? And that... You can find that in the book of Number, the book of Number, and that's what that means. What is this? Any idea? Remember, God used all the time. God used all the time, Mother Nature, to make us realize that God exists. And we agree on that, right? Through nature, we can connect with God. Do you have any idea how the manna looked like and what was? Huh? Like a frost, but not exactly. Yeah, that's, you see, that's what we have in mentality. Oh, it's like a frost that every, every day they collect it. But no, it's not that. Even today, did you see this, this picture here? This picture exists. This is more or less the same type of tree that produced the manna. Okay? It, it, it's still existing today. What they did is Mana was a little seed that they collected daily, they ground it, and they make a flat bread from that. Was a seed. And that seed, let me pinpoint that here for you. So you can read that in the book of Numbers. What number eleven seventeen tells you exactly what mana was. And I cannot read it for you because if I try to read and speak at the same time English, we are all screwed. We have, we have to go home, okay? Uh, but it's in the book of Numbers 11, verse 7 
through nine that tell you exactly what mana, how mana was. Okay. Knowing that, knowing that, I'm going to connect some of the Old Testament with the New Testament together to understand better about that. Do you remember the sacrifice that they have to do in the Old Testament to forgive their sin, right? They have to do what with the animal? Bring an animal to slaughter and blah, 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 right? It's another part of the Old Testament and in the Old Testament that you have to deal with two animals. One was to sacrifice that animal for the forgiveness of the sin, and the other animal used to live with you in your house for a week or so. And then at the end of the week, you have to take that animal, drive it to the desert, and leave it lost in the desert. Because according to their mentality, that, that animal carry all the sin of the people that was there. Okay, that's, that's why they, okay, this is the animal is going to collect during this week all our sin. We are going to drop it on the desert, get lost forever, and disappear. So we are purified that way. That was the second way to do it. Having that in mind, you are going to understand now why Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. I have to clarify this. In the Old Testament, the mentality was that below the, the water, underneath, very deep, was what the devil used to live. That was their mentality. Oh, deep in the water, the devil is there. And then, what happened when the people was baptized by John the Baptist, keep in mind that that type of baptism, it was not to become God's people. Those people already belonged to God's people. That was a type of confession what John the Baptist was doing. Was confession. And the only way in their mind they said, okay, I'm clean, is when you take a bath, when you are dairy and you take a bath and you know, oh, smell clean. Huh? So that's why he submerged them in water. So their mentality, okay, I'm clean, all my sins are down there in the bottom of the river. So at that moment when Jesus was baptized, Jesus collect all our sin that we left down there, and that's why he went to the desert. And that's why he went to the desert. And then we are purified. He started his ministry at that moment. Remember, that was not the baptism of him to become part of God's people. It was type of confession and purification that he would start there. And this is important for us to know because it's, it's part of the sacrifice that we do inside the Mass. During the first time of the Mass, you know the Mass is split in two sections. I'm not going to enter in detail with that. Father Alex will do it because I don't have the time for that. And I, I have to look at my notes because when you don't have hair here, you don't retain too much. Okay? Sorry, but I have to look at my notes. I have to look at my notes. Okay, so that is clear on that. In the Old Testament, no, they don't, they don't have that here. In the Old Testament, on the tabernacle, the ten of the dwelling, they used to have a cotton, a, 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 a blanket or whatever, cover the, how, how do you say that? Curtain. It, it, there are some words that I cannot even pronounce in Spanish, but I got some help from here. 
you all hear him, okay? That thing that covered the front, the, the split. Do you have any idea why that was covered? That was covered because in order for you to enter, you have, first of all, be purified, and second, you have to have a good relationship with God in order to enter. Other than that, you will die if you enter like that. You, immediately you will be dead. In the Old Testament, you're going to check also in the book of Leviticus and Numbers when the priest has to dress in a unique way, but then it was not underwear there. Nobody used underwear at that time. But in the basement, the garment of the priest, the underwear show up. That was the first time the underwear is mentioned in the Bible. Why? Because even you have to know how to dress to approach God. If that is still applied today, most of all, we will be dead right now. Because if someone approaches in a negative way close to God, God will punish them immediately and will kill them. And that is one thing that we have to be careful how we dress. That is in the book, in the Bible also. I can give you at the end, if you want it, all the places that I'm talking about so you can read on your own Bible. Because the problem that we have with most of these retreats for information also, we give all of that. The people listen, but they don't check later on in their houses. And they forget about it. And then is when we start, where, where was that, where was that, where was that? Hey. Getting out, and then you read it yourself. That's the best way to do it. So we are clear on that. So in order to get close to the tabernacle on the Old Testament, you have to be purified, you have to dress properly, and is when you can enter and talk to God directly. Uh, in today's society, that is like a wedding. In today's society, you know what the veil on the on the bride mean? The veil on the bride mean is uncovered. But I'm gone at the at the after they are blessed. I'm going to uncover my face. So you can see it because I preserve myself just for you and nobody else. That's what the veil means. That veil that covered the face of the bride. It's the same with God. Most of the tabernacle, I don't know if this what got the curtain inside. Yeah, most, most of them, after you open the door of the tabernacle, or the tabernacle they have the curtain there. And that's what that means. Okay, now I was reserved for you. You can consume me. It's important to understand that what we receive, what we receive is a living God. A lot of people ask me, why you kneel when you are going to take communion? And let me tell you, I kneel all the time. I don't like receiving communion standing up. And let me tell you why. Because in the letter of St. Paul said, In front of Jesus, all knees should bend and recognize his authority. That's why I kneel when I receive communion. Back then, most of you, they are more or less my age. That's how we used to receive communion. In the rail, remember, it was a rail around the altar and we have to kneel. Because that was a reason. It's based, it's based on the Bible, the reason. To receive communion kneeling. Because if I recognize that I'm receiving a living God, and it's Jesus really present, alive there, so I have to respect that. And I have to recognize that He is all authority, and I have to obey and recognize his position and authority. That's why 
I kneel when I'm going to receive communion. Most of the time, most of the time, oh, Jesus, when he go to the desert, you can read that in Matthew and Mark. You can, you can find that at the end of the gospel there. I'm sorry, at the beginning of the gospel when he started his preaching. Did you know when, when the priest break the, the communion and we as a Catholic, we say that every single particle of the communion is Jesus present there? We, we agree on that, right? We know that that's true. I can see some faces like, I don't know about that. I'm going to tell you a little story. I have a friend that he's from Mexico. And when he was five, from five to 12, 13 years old, he loved to go to Mars on Sundays. That was the only mass that was available where he was living. On Sundays. And he loved when he knew it was Sunday, he was the first time to wake up, to take a bath, get dressed, and run to the, to the church. Because he wanted to see how the priest did magic. And I said, what do you mean that the priest did magic? Oh, yeah, the priest, he was magic and said, why? And, and this is what he told me. And when he was telling me, he was already 65 years old. When he started telling me why, he started crying. He said, I remember when the priest, right, and break. Do you know the, the, the Holy Communion have a cross? Have a cross, right? So he said that when the priest split that in twice, the cross jumped to both sides. And if the priest split that in four sections, was four crosses. Never was broke. That's what he was seeing at that moment. I said, that tell you that Jesus is present even in the little particle that we consume. It's unique. It's unique. All this. There are few secrets. Remember, when we are going to receive communion, we're supposed to go purify and remember on the Old Testament in someone touched the Ark of Covenant. What happened? If someone touched, do you remember the Ark of Covenant? Yeah, Lord killed them. Why? Because they were not purified, and also they was not ready to receive and touch and approach God the right way. How many times we approach communion and proper, not the right way? If we are honest, if all of us, we are honest, sometimes we do. Sometimes we do. It's easy for us to say, I go to confession later. But what about if God reverses the process and bring the Old Testament at that moment when you're receiving Him improperly? You will die. You are dead right there. In that we have to be we are careful how we approach that and how we receive a Holy Communion. The right way to present yourself getting close to God about basement, you can read that in Exodus 28. I'm not going to tell you which, in which verse you look for it. Okay? Right there, you can find that. You can find that. And there are few... I have to... Believe it or not, I'm talking to you already for half an hour. And some of you, are, I can read your mind. Some of you, oh my God, 45 minutes. That bald guy is going to kill us. Uh, there are some... People, they, they die also because they did not went to worship God. 
Just imagine, even if you approach from the wrong way, you will die. But also, if you don't go to worship God, you can die too. And that is an example that we can read in the Old Testament. First Samuel, First Samuel, uh, chapter six. Then again, I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell the the the. The verse you look in that chapter, okay. I got it. If you want it later on, I can give it to you. There are seven secrets. Did you all know that there are least seven secrets hiding in the mass? If any of you, any of you heard that before, there are seven secrets that in the late, in the next fifteen minutes, which is what I got left to talk to you. I'm going to tell you not deep in that, but just briefly. The first is Jesus is alive, the first secret. We all know that, right? We all know that. We agree that he's alive. But here is the problem. If we know that he's alive and we receive him, he's alive inside us. So when we walk out, we are in living tabernacles. Okay? We are in a procession. Eucharistic procession because we have a living God inside us. And if I have it, that's a procession. That's a Eucharistic procession. What I'm doing, walking out when the priest said this Mass is over. So remember the word mass means what you learn here you have to go forward and show it to others that's what that means and uh, remember I'm not going to enter in details in every single one but second, uh, second secret Jesus is not alone when we receive communion I'm going to clarify those two points the second is Jesus is not alone. Sacramentally, when you receive communion, you receive Jesus, just Jesus, 100%. But here, spiritual speaking, this is the problem. Jesus never is alone because whenever he is, the Holy Trinity is with him too. And all the saints and the angels. Jesus is our king. We agree on that. He's our king. Tell me which king go to places without his court. Not a single king unless he's a naughty one. Not a single king. All the king go with his group, with his backup and his defense to protect. Jesus is the same when we receive it. According to this, I want you to realize if you have a dead relative, a family that passed away already, when you receive Jesus, those holy people, they are part of our life, mom, dad, grandpa, whoever it is, it's come to us too at that moment. Because wherever Jesus is, they are our too. That is important to understand. You see, Saint Teresa, the little flower, she was a orphan. Her mom died way before she received first communion. The day of the first communion, she was crying, but crying like you never imagined. She was crying. And the sister who was taking care of her, the sister at the convent said, poor Teresa, She's crying because her mom is not here for the first communion. But guess what? At the end of her life, when she finished her diary, it said, the day of my first communion, I cried for joy because I knew that my mom was in heaven with God and Jesus. And if I received Jesus, she was with him. And that's why she was crying. You see, those are sections that we don't connect. We are so far away for the, from the reality of what we receive in Holy Communion that we don't understand. 
How beautiful is that? There are people that all their lives they are crying because someone passed away. Ten years after, I used to take care of people in my office that still crying ten, ten years after. I said, wow, you, you really don't know what become a Christian is, a good Catholic is. Number three, third secret, is just one Holy Eucharist. That's it. Just one Holy Eucharist. We come to, to Holy Eucharist every week. But it's just one united in the past, in the present, and in the future. It's just one. Just one. Back then, in the beginning of the Holy Eucharist, when the apostles start doing the, the, the Mass complete, the bishops used to send a piece of the Holy Communion that they break to the parish, which connect all of them in one holy sacrifice. Not in many holy sacrifice, just one. Okay? Number four. It's not just a miracle. It's not just a miracle. There are many things happen through the Holy Eucharist. There are people... Did you ever go to... Uh, which is wrong to say, I'm going to a healing mass? If any of, you, any of you hear that expression, I'm going to a healing mass, that is improper to say. That's wrong to say. Because on all the masses, even a regular mass during the week, you can get healed if you want to. All depends on how you go to receive Jesus. The only difference with that, the call uh, uh, healing mass, is because they use the anointing of the oil, the oil of anointing. That's, that's the only reason, but not supposed to call a healing mass. That's wrong. Every mass can perform a miracle. All depends how you approach to get communion. Then, number five, we just not receive. We just not receive. What that means is, we receive, but at the same time, we have to give back to the community. We have to give back to those who are, who are around us. My goodness, time fly. Let me go uh, real uh, quick here. Number number six. Each each Eucharist supposed to be different. Each Eucharist supposed to be different. If you receive all of them the same way, something wrong in the spiritual life. Every time you receive communion, you have to feel something better inside you. Something that really puts you up forward to continue in your life. So that means each communion is supposed to be better for me. Not just the same like the last week. If it was the same like the last week, I have to enter to my brain and check it out what is wrong with me what I'm missing here with the Holy Eucharist number seven there's no limit of number to receive communion daily I'm going to clarify that okay there are not limits on how many times I can receive communion daily by law you receive just once daily by law. But in a spiritual level, you can receive as many times as you want. You, you understand that point, right? In a spiritual way, you can receive every, every five minutes. But physically, just once. And in the same day, in a special occasion, 
second time. But that's the only time that you receive more than once when it's a second Eucharist in a special occasion, like weddings, baptism, confirmation. Okay? That's, that's the only way that you receive, you can receive twice the Holy Eucharist. And then, when you receive Holy Communion, even in the Old Testament, there was a process that you have to do in order to do better. It was a big process. It, it, that apply even today for us. It's the same. It's the same. It doesn't change on that. The process that we have to do to prepare. To prepare. For me, it's sad that I go to church sometimes and I see people receiving communion and they go out the door. They walk out the door without waiting for the final blessing. I have a good friend of mine uh, from here, I'm going to say from here, I'm not going to say the town because you may know them and then you will go and ask them and they will be embarrassing for them. But some of you know them. He used to do that. And she used to do that. Both of the couple. Receive communion out of the door without the final blessing. So one day they invite me, they invite me to their home uh, for supper. I said, okay, they are going to do good supper, so let me go. It's, you know, all of us, we love to go to some place, but... To, for supper, especially when it's free. Huh? Especially when it's free. All of us, we love to go there. So I went there. I went there. I did supper. She brought the dessert. I ate the dessert. And she went to the kitchen to prepare something for her. And I disappeared. I went home. And she called me mad. But she was steaming mad. How you left my house without saying bye to you and blah, blah, blah. blah. I said, it, it, that bothered you. Yes, that bothered me. That was cruel. You don't do that. Oh, I'm glad that you feel that way. Now you know how Jesus feels every time after communion you walk away. Since then, she never did that again. She <laughs> got the point. She got the point. Since that point, she was the last one to get exit. You know, sometimes that's what we need, you know. Sometimes a little bit of wake up to find out where we stand. In. And I'm sorry, my time is out. And for some of you said, oh, thank you, God. He's done. I uh, was a pleasure to be here with all of you. Now we're going to take... 10 minute break and then Father Alec will do his presentation and after that we are going to do the Holy Mass explain each part of the Mass what's going on and what happened so in this Mass you can have communion too ok because it's a special Mass remember what I told you ok God bless you all Ten, ten minute break, okay? Ten minute break. Okay. Oh, there, there are some water there if you need it.
again, if anyone needs refreshments in the back, we have uh, some water and we just got some chips in as well. So, if yeah, some chips. You got some chips. Did you all understand my dad? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. He, 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 he's, a little, he's a little shy about that sometimes, but wonderful, wonderful. Te entendieron. <laughs> I was saying they, they, they understood you. Everything's okay. They say that because you have no choice. You are here. <laughs> Is the first time? Oh. <laughs> Every now and again, he asks me if I'm if I'll change it to up here. Hmm? Oh, good, excellent, excellent. There'll be a test afterwards. <laughs> Hope you paid attention. <laughs> There's some big feet, I'll tell you that.
Very good. Okay. Let's see here. All right. Very good. So, uh, and so my dad talked a little bit about the uh, biblical foundations of why we believe in the Eucharist. And so for my part, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of how we as a Catholic people from the earliest years uh, worshipped and cared for the Eucharist. The reason I wanted to go through the, uh, through the history of it is because although as a Catholic church we do believe in the scriptures to be one of the core foundations of our faith, the reality of it is, is that the Church of Christ, God's action in the world, does not end with the Scriptures. If that were the case, we wouldn't be here doing this. We wouldn't be here offering worship and uh, love to the world, to our brothers and sisters, through God. If Christ's Church would have ended with the Scriptures, then it would have ended 2,000 years ago. But the church, because it is a living, it, because it is the living body of Christ, it demands that the church would continue on so long as our earthly world exists. It is absolutely imperative that one of the marks of Christ's church is that it continue on to bring salvation to the world. So for us, Although much of what we understand and much of what we know about our history comes from the Bible, it is the one, one of the uh, core foundations, the Bible is not the only thing. We as a Catholic people have a rich tradition and history to work alongside the Holy Scriptures. So here, this particular, um, this particular chapel um, that I have... Uh, shown here. This is the chapel at the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament in Hansville, Alabama. Uh, that's where Mother Angelica, who started the EWTN uh, television network that is still going on all these decades after, uh, in Hansville, her order of the Franciscan Sisters uh, they have a shrine there in the middle of literal nowhere, Alabama. Uh, and this particular chapel, in the picture, it looks small. It, it really does. But to get a proper scale of how big this is, so in this picture here, this is the monstrance where they put the, the host, they put the Eucharist in it to put, uh, like, we would for uh, Eucharistic adoration. The monstrance here in, in All Saints, we would place the monstrance here on the altar. The monstrance that we have here at, at, at uh, All Saints is mm, roughly roughly about this big. You know, it, it's not it's not a small monstrance by any means. This one here, depicted in the chapel over in Hansville, Alabama, literally, it is this tall. Literally, the host on the inside is about this big around. The reason, the reason they did that was because they wanted that from any corner in the chapel that everyone would have an absolutely clear line of sight to see and worship the body of Christ. And so this particular, so in the, at the shrine, they have that chapel, they have another chapel uh, down underneath uh, that's called the crypt, where uh, as the sisters who serve and worship there, as they uh, enter into their eternal reward, there's a crypt there where in the walls they place the sisters for their eternal rest. Uh, and there also at the shrine, there is a, um, uh, a replica, uh, a life-size replica of one of the... Uh, uh, grottos of Lourdes uh, with our Our Lady of Lourdes uh, and also there is what's called a uh, what was the technical term they had for it? Well, so it's a, it's a building set aside a little bit larger than the social hall across, across the way here that is dedicated to the history and uh, in representing 
uh, biblical scenes as to, again, why we believe in the Eucharist. It's a Eucharist, Eucharistic, uh, uh, Eucharistic sort of, kind of like a museum, sort of, but that's not quite the right word for it. But anyway, it's a wonderful place to go for a day or two to just kind of re reinvigorate our love for God and our love for the Holy Eucharist. If you have the opportunity to go, I would highly suggest it. It's a beautiful, wonderful, peaceful little place, a little corner of the world where it can be you and God, and there's nothing there to distract you. There's nothing there that uh, would draw your mind away from the Lord. So this is a particularly favorite place of mine in the entire world. There we go. I'm in desperate need of a new computer. <laughs> so, okay, so talking about a few points that my dad made, these are within the New Testament. These are some of the more uh, hard-hitting realities and hard-hitting uh, teachings that we hold as a Catholic people as to why we believe in the Eucharist. The most famous scripture passage is, of course, John 6. It is there where Christ directly and explicitly says that anyone who is to follow him must eat of the flesh of Christ and must drink his blood. The words that he uses in the New Testament here, in John 6, it is a literal understanding of chewing on the flesh of Christ. The Lord doesn't, doesn't use... Uh, as it is in the English, simply the word eat, where it's kind of a, a, an amorphous sort of vague uh, action. But in the, original, in the original Aramaic and in the original Greek, the word is to gnaw, like the way that a dog would gnaw on a bone. We are called to literally physically chew on the flesh of Christ and to drink of the life-giving blood of our Lord. First Corinthians, so St. John and St. Paul, in, per, in a particular way, those two are the uh, sort of hard-hitting foundational uh, apostles of our belief in the Eucharist. In 1 Corinthians 10, 16, uh, St. Paul enters into the reality of what it is the people of God, what it is the Christian people would uh, partake in every week, every Sunday. He says specifically to the Corinthians, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? And so following up with Christ's uh, teaching in John 6, here we have the foundations of why we believe and understand that the church from the beginning taught in a literal, physical uh, manner of partaking with Christ within the Eucharist. In the other part of 1 Corinthians, uh, so chapter 11, where my dad earlier was talking about how in the Old Testament to approach God unworthily, to approach God casually, there were serious ramifications along with that. There were serious consequences that the entire community knew that you would incur God's just wrath if you approached Unworthily, if you approach without the due reverence and love necessary. In 1 Corinthians uh, 11, 23 through 29, we have here, let me, get, let me just get to the good part here. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. If we believed the Eucharist to simply be a symbol, why would we incur death? The only reason that we incur death if we partake 
of the Lord in an unworthy manner is because if God is the foundation and the source of our life, if we therefore by our sins cut off our relationship from God, then we do not have the ability to receive life as much as God would want to share it with us. If we put up a block through mortal sin on our hearts and on our souls, as much as the Lord would want to, we do not have the ability to receive life from Christ. So with every time that we approach the Eucharist, it is of the utmost importance that if we need to go to confession first, that we make sure that we do, that we go to confession first, and after we have removed that obstacle from our lives, after we have removed that obstacle from our heart and our soul, we are therefore open once again to receive the life from Christ within the Eucharist. We are therefore able to receive the life-giving blood in the host and in the chalice. And so the institution narrative are, uh, are the narratives by which uh, we believe that the, uh, that the synoptic gospels uh, relate to us very, um, uh, what, what would be the word, um, faithfully. They faithfully relate to us the way in which Christ at the Last Supper instituted the gift of the Eucharist, instituted the gift of the Mass. And it is therefore from that Last Supper where Christ therefore tells his disciples, do this in memory of me. From that point on, the, the tradition and the worship of the Christian people has always been centered on the Mass. It has always been centered on once again being able to partake of the literal and physical body and blood of our Lord in the same way that the Virgin Mary, St. Joseph, and the Apostles in that way that they lived physically with Christ, alongside Christ, we in our own day and age, almost 2,000 years later, have that same opportunity to receive life from the one who gives life. So as I mentioned earlier, the church and the reality of the body of Christ in his followers, in those who are disciples of the Lord, it does not end with the scriptures, but it continues on throughout history. St. Ignatius of Antioch is an incredibly important source for us as a Christian people because in his letters, in his writings, he uh, very faithfully once again laid out the beliefs of the Christian people and laid out how it is that the Christian people worshipped Christ and God. Here, St. Ign Ignatius of Antioch is speaking out against those who are, for whatever reason, uh, disseminating the false belief that the Eucharist is not the body and blood of Christ. At this point in time, uh, these were, were people who were called the Gnostics and the Docetists. These are different groups of heretical teaching, heresy, uh, a teaching that is against the Catholic faith. These heretical groups were going around telling people that, yes, it seems as though God became man and entered into the world, but that was just an illusion. God did not take on a physical body. God did not literally die upon the cross. With a theology as bad as that, that if that were the case, that it was all just an, an illusion, then God would be a trickster. God would be... Uh, uh, be fooling the entirety of the world. That is not what God wants. God wants to share himself completely and totally with his people. And so these Gnostics and Docetists, they caused a lot of confusion and a lot of chaos within the church at that time by teaching the terrible, the terrible blasphemous thought that Christ did not physically die on the cross 
to save us from our sins. If that is not the case, then we are still stuck in sin. If that is not the case, we are still awaiting our true Messiah. So here, St. Ignatius of Antioch, in the year uh, 110, so if we, if we have in mind the sort of uh, time frame in where Christ is born more or less around 0 AD, uh, the, the numbers get, get fudged a little bit because trying to keep track of a history so long ago, that, that's really difficult to do, to, to have it at such a pre precise uh, counting as we would like in our modern day and age where we have clocks everywhere, we have calendars. This was not the case at that time. So if we have a time frame of, let's say, let's try to give a few years of buffer, maybe like 4 BC, 4 AD, somewhere around there. If Christ is born in this area and dies around the year 33, so St. Ignatius of Antioch is less than 100 years uh, separated from the Gospels and from the disciples. Even more so, the reality is he died in about 110. So he, he began life much earlier. And so we have uh, the assurance that St. Ignatius of Antioch, he would have heard, if not directly from the disciples themselves, although we have every understanding and belief that he did, he would at the very least have heard from the disciples of the disciples. Again, we are a, we are a one holy Catholic apostolic church. The tradition of the truth continues on through the apostles, through the disciples, all the way down to our own day and age. St. Ignatius of Antioch is arrested and thrown to the lions by the Romans in 110. As he's being transported to be martyred in the Colosseum, he writes out the beliefs of the Christian people that there would be no longer any... any uh, confusion about what it is the Christian people believe. He writes about how the Christian people worship, that there would be no misunderstanding or uh, wrong ideas of what it is those Christians do when they're hidden in their home. The Ignatius of is explicit in his, re, in his uh, teaching of what the early church believed the Eucharist to be. Consider those who are of a different opinion, how, it, how opposed they are to the will of God. They abstain from the Eucharist and from prayer because they confess not the Eucharist to be the flesh of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Those, therefore, who speak against this gift of God incur death in the midst of their disputes. St. Ignatius of Antioch is explicit, explicitly uses the word Eucharist. He explicitly explains that those who do not believe that the Eucharist is the body of Christ, they are separated from the people of God. They are a separate group who do not have the right to call themselves Christians. The entirety of the Christian faith was uh, was together it was whole and perfect for the first for, for the first millennia of the church there was a clear and distinct uh, separation of what a Christian was and what a Christian was not so from that point on uh, as the church develops in its practice and as the church develops its uh, understanding and love of the Eucharist, we therefore fall into uh, how it is that the, that the church lives this belief out. There is a famous saying, uh, lex orandi, lex credendi, lex vivendi. The law of prayer is the law of belief and therefore is the law of life. How we pray, what we pray, signifies what we believe. And how we believe, therefore, 
disseminates itself in how we live our lives. Our daily lives, our daily prayers, and our daily worship of God, they are all connected. You cannot believe that Christ is the Son of God and therefore, however, live as if He didn't exist. That is, that is, an, uh, that is a broken way of thinking. That is a broken way of living. If we pray to Jesus Christ as our God, if we believe that to be so, then when we encounter God, there, there are particular ways that we should act in our worship of Him. There are particular ways of life that we should desire to separate ourselves from if they cause a block or an obstacle to our relationship with God. So, lex orandi, lex credendi, lex vivendi. In the early church, uh, there were a group of men and women who would take their entire lives and set themselves apart from society, set themselves apart from the hustle and bustle of daily life, and live as hermits. They would dedicate their entire lives to prayer and to study of the scripture in order to more personally and more reverently dedicate every thought, every word, and every action to the worship of God. Uh, the hermits, therefore, because they were separated from the main uh, sort of cities and the main towns of their day and age, it was necessary that when they could go to Mass, they would go join up with their fellow Christians, but afterwards, because they would separate themselves off for months and years at a time, they would therefore receive the opportunity of having uh, in a small pix, uh, what we call a pix. Let's see here. We call this parking it in the garage. <laughs> so a pix, they would have a pix given to them by either the priest or the bishop that was offering Mass, take, put the communion, the Eucharist, in the pix, close it up, put it in a special uh, satchel or pouch, and they would carry it under their clothing in order to protect it from thieves and from the elements of the world. The hermits, therefore, were given the uh, distinct and unique privilege of holding and protecting the Eucharist within their own private caves, within their own private cells. They would therefore use those caves and cells as shrines for the Blessed Sacrament. They would use them as small churches where they would spend their time in worship of God physically present among them. And they would use that time to pray and to study the Holy Word of God while at the same time sharing their living quarters with the Holy Word of God. So here, uh, this, is a particular, this is a painting of St. Anthony the Great. Uh, St. Anthony the Great, uh, let me look at my notes here, uh, he was born in 251, but he began his life as a hermit actually very early on in his life. He began his life as, as a hermit uh, not much older than the age of 20. Uh, considered the father of monks, it was through his writing and through his example that the church continued on with this particular style of life, this particular vocation for men and women throughout the world and throughout all time. Uh, he actually, there, there are records that St. Anthony the Great physically fought against Satan himself. Satan would bring every kind of temptation and would even physically uh, throw St. Anthony to the ground. Uh, Satan had the power at that time to physically cause bruises and wounds against St. Anthony. But because of his love for God and because of his uh, deep devotion to the Eucharist, St. Anthony did not have to worry about the attacks from Satan because he knew ultimately my salvation is here. My salvation is sharing my living quarters with me. I have nothing to fear 
but God alone. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, and as Dad mentioned earlier, um, when in, in the early church, when the bishop would have mass, he would take one of the hosts and split them off into uh, smaller pieces. He would therefore give those pieces to the deacons at that time to where they could spread out uh, the smaller pieces of the larger host that the bishop had so that at the next mass the other bishops and priests could consume that one main host to show their connection to their bishop and to show their connection throughout the world as one holy Catholic church. Uh, So again, because of the dangers of their day and age, not only of... uh, the pagans who were would, whenever they could, cause as much damage as they could to their Christian brothers and sisters, they had to hide the fact that they were carrying this most holy and sacred Eucharist within, within them. Uh, so the way that it was called is the species were placed in a small receptacle called a chrismal, worn either bandolier fashion or in a little bag, hung around the neck under their clothing. This tradition, therefore, is continued by us whenever we go to visit uh, a member of our family or a member of our church who is sick in the hospital. Anyone who brings the Eucharist to them, this is how it is desired by the church that the minister of the Eucharist, whether it be a priest or one of the faithful of the parish, that the Eucharist within the Pyx would be carried close to the heart in order to protect the Eucharist from any kind of propination, from any kind of uh, from any kind of fear of losing it. You don't lose your head, you don't lose the Eucharist. (laughs) That's the hope anyway. So to have it close to your heart, to protect it from the outside dangers of the world, to make sure that that the Lord gets to where he needs to be This tradition, therefore, is continued on even in our own day and age. So it was not only to have the host ready for communion, but also to ensure safety against robbers and protection against the hazards of travel, whether it be the roads in and of themselves or the elements in the weather outside. This is a picture of uh, St. Tarsisius. St. Tarsisius was a 12-year-old boy who lived in the 300s, more or less. There is a particular story of St. Tarsisius that there was a mass that he attended at one point, where sadly, out of a need to protect themselves from prying eyes, and out of a need to protect themselves from the Roman spies, at this particular mass where St. Tarsisius was found, there were no deacons that could therefore take the host from the bishop in order to spread it out and share it with the other priests and bishops in the area. St. Tarsisius at that time was uh, in the same effect as a altar server that we have nowadays. He would go to mass, he would help the priests, he would prepare whatever they needed in order to uh, help with the sacrifice of the holy mass. St. Tarsisius, therefore, being the only one there at that time, he was provided a pyx and a little pouch to put underneath his robes. He was given, at the age of 12, the responsibility of carrying Christ from the house church that they celebrated in to bring it to the other priests and bishops in the area. Sadly, St. Tarsisius uh, was found out by some of the other kids in the area. At the time, as he was traveling from the main church to visit the other priests and bishops, uh, the other kids, they invited St. Tarsisius to play with them. They, they, he was just like a normal boy, like anybody else, and so they invited him to play some games along with them. But he said, no, I can't right now. I'm, I'm, I'm doing something important. They noticed that St. Tarsisius was, you know guarding something around his neck. He was guarding something close to his heart. And so, being uh, curious, 
the other boys, they went and asked him, what are you carrying? What do you have? And so St. Tarsisius, he tries to diffuse the situation. He says, oh, don't, don't, you know, don't worry about it. I just, there's something important that I need to do. Sadly, the curiosity of the other boys in the, in the uh, neighborhood, it changed from curiosity to maliciousness. They, through force, wanted to know what it was that Tarsisius was carrying. So ultimately, sadly, they beat Tarsisius unconscious and found what he was carrying. They found that it was a pyx with the sacred uh, Eucharist in his, in, in, close to his heart. Thankfully, uh, although a bit late, uh, a fellow Christian in the neighborhood, he was able to scatter the boys off, and sadly, he had to carry Tarsisius and bury him and continue the uh, assignment that, that had been given to St. Tarsisius. I bring up this, this story, although it is sad, but the reality is that this young boy, again, no more than 12, at this time had a courage that is very rare in our own day and age. St. Tarsisius was willing to die to protect the Eucharist. He was willing to die in order to make sure that his responsibility of making sure that Christ was shared throughout the world was accomplished. We could learn a lot from this example of St. Tarsisius. We could learn a lot of how we as a Catholic people are called to bring the message of God and bring God physically into the world with our brothers and sisters. So in the Council of Nicaea, which is the council in which the church uh, officially states that Christ is both God, fully God, and fully man. Uh, at the time, there was a, a, a bad priest who did not pay attention in seminary, and he was teaching that Christ was not God, but rather the most powerful man that existed. Essentially, Christ in Arius's mind was lowered from the title of God and made into a superman. Sure, Christ was the greatest of all men, he was the most powerful of all men, but he was only man. In the Council of Nicaea, it was there that the church finally stated uh, directly and explicitly, we as a holy Catholic apostolic church believe that Christ is man, but also completely and fully God. After this time, <coughs> after, uh, during the Council of Nicaea, Christianity was finally allowed and tolerated throughout the entire Roman Empire. Uh, Emperor Constantine, who is uh, seen in the middle as the one who finally uh, favored Christianity and allowed the open worship of Christ, uh, at this time in the Council of Nicaea, the Eucharist was finally able to be disseminated openly and publicly to different churches and different monasteries and convents. They no longer had to hide away the Eucharist in their pyxes underneath their robes in fear of Roman spies or of Roman citizens. But finally and openly, churches would open their doors to people who believed in Christ that they could come and worship the literal and physical body and blood of our Lord and Savior. <clears throat> Even by the uh, 800s and before them, the Blessed Sacrament was kept within the monastic church close to the altar so that people finally knew where they could go to have the assurance that Christ was there as well. They not only had Christ within their hearts spiritually, but they had a physical central location where together as a church community, where together as disciples of Christ, they could go and gather to worship before Christ, just as the original 12 apostles did. And so then up to the 11th century, the real presence was taken for granted within Catholic belief. However, 
there are always going to be people who want to try to push the envelope in terms of what is it we truly believe and don't believe. How much can we get away with? How much do we actually have to believe a certain thing in order to remain Catholic? Or perhaps not. Uh, in the early uh, 1000, the year 1000, uh, that particular century, there was a deacon, uh, uh, Berengarius, who is pictured on the right, who at the time was teaching throughout the churches of France that the uh, that the symbol and the presence of Christ was not actually physically present in the Eucharist. He taught that it was merely a symbol and that it did not have the same uh, the same need for reverence as worship of God Himself. It was the first time that a Catholic clergyman publicly denied the uh, reality of Christ within the Eucharist. Thankfully, however, uh, Pope Gregory VII, who is pictured on the left, he spoke with Berengarius and ordered him to sign a retraction and to go about to all the different places where he taught and to uh, take back the blasphemy that he had taught, to take back the heresy that he had taught and to share once again the reality that the Catholic Church has from the beginning and all throughout time taught the reality that Christ was pre is present in the host and in the chalice that is consecrated during Mass. So this was the Church's first definitive statement of what had always been believed and up to that point had never been seriously challenged. From that, uh, from that dynamic, therefore, in order to bring about a greater understanding and a greater reverence among the people and to give a greater explanation that, no, what is found within the Eucharist is Christ himself. What is found within the chalice is the very blood that purified and cleansed us of our sins. From that time onward, then, processions of the Blessed Sacrament in where our Lord would may be made public and present throughout the towns and throughout the cities. Uh, processions were instituted, prescribed acts of adoration, legislated, uh, and the cells of the... Uh, of the nuns in different convents, the... the mothers, superiors of the different communities, their particular cell would always have a window pointed toward the tabernacle in their convent. That way they could even within the privacy of their own cell, they could look at the general direction of where Christ was and offer themselves spiritually uh, to our Lord and share spiritually with our Lord. And so in the 1200s, we come to a young nun named St. Juliana, Sister Juliana. Sister Juliana had a great devotion to the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, and this was seen in her from the earliest years of her life. St. Juliana, because of her great love and devotion to Christ, she was given a particular uh, revelation, given a particular vision, in where she saw the, uh, a full moon in all of its beauty and glory, but that there was uh, a dark line that covered the middle of the moon so that you could see the outer uh, edges, but part of it was hidden, part of it was obscured from uh, shining its light onto the world. The Lord, in his own way, revealed to St. Juliana that this was because he was saddened that there wasn't a specific and explicit feast in order to give worship and to give reverence to the reality of, bo uh, of God's body and blood in the Eucharist. Therefore, thankfully, uh, she was friends with an archdeacon who later became uh, Pope Urban IV. 
Pope Urban IV, after having shared time with St. Juliana and having heard of her vision, he, there, he therefore, after he became Pope, instituted the Feast of Corpus Christi. He instituted the Feast of the Body and Blood of our Lord. And so we have... So this week on Thursday, I believe, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, uh, this week we will be celebrating Corpus Christi the feast of the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so this particular feast, we have St. Juliana to thank because of her love for the Eucharist and because of her devotion to Christ. In order to give greater solemnity to Corpus Christi, St. Pope Urban IV uh, therefore uh, asked St. Thomas Aquinas to write some hymns in order to be sung whenever the Eucharist was exposed. He asked St. Thomas Aquinas to write hymns that would be used in Eucharistic adoration and in the processions of the Eucharist. Therefore, St. Thomas Aquinas took time and wrote three different hymns. These hymns, therefore, are the ones that up to this day and age, from the 1200s, we continue to use them for adoration and for the processions because of the deep and rich theological realities that St. Thomas Aquinas shares in these hymns. These hymns are known as O Salutari Sostia, Tantum Ergo, and the Panis Angelicus. So I'm going to play just a little bit of each of them. Uh, I'm sure many of you know which ones they are, but in case you haven't had the opportunity to hear them, uh, these are how they sound. So this is uh, O Salutaris Ostia. Won't work if it's on mute. I wish I could do the whole thing, but we got to keep moving. <laughs> but so those three hymns were written in the 1200s, and because of their beauty and uh, rich theological significance, we continue to use them even in our own day and age.
And so even though we have all of these beautiful ways of spending time with our Lord in the Eucharist, even though we have all these different and beautiful traditions of processions and, and reserving the, the Eucharist in the tabernacle and of exposing the Eucharist uh, in adoration and all of these wonderful and holy things, ultimately, all of these practices are meant to prepare us and are meant to keep our hearts inflamed with the love of Christ for the most important way of worshiping Christ. And that is by receiving him in Holy Communion. The greatest of all the acts of worship that we can offer to Christ is to unite ourselves spiritually and physically in a worthy way in Holy Communion. This is what everything else leads up to. This is the whole point of why we are here as a Christian Catholic people. This is the whole reason that we have the sacraments to cleanse us and to prepare us to receive Christ spiritually and physically here in this world so that we would be able to share life with Christ spiritually and physically in the world to come. And so, in order to have a better understanding of how best to receive, how best to receive Christ in Holy Communion, I, I want to show just a short little video of the different ways that we can do, and some things that we need to be careful of, some things that we really need to put a lot of thought into. Ah, yes, Communion, the Sacrament of the Eucharist. For many of us, the last time we learned about it was in first grade. And who can remember that far back? So how about a little refresher on how to receive this most holy sacrament? Okay, let's start with the fact that the church gives us two options. The consecrated host may be received either on the tongue or in the hand, at the discretion of each communicant. Sounds simple enough. Two options, your choice. But you may be surprised at how easy it is to get those wrong. We're not taking, snatching, or biting. We receive our Lord Jesus in Holy Communion. You see, it's important to understand theologically that we don't take the Eucharist. Rather, all we can do is make ourselves completely open and receptive to this beautiful gift of grace that God is offering us. And we do that by gently extending our tongue, or, as St. Cyril of Jerusalem said in the 4th century, receive communion by making a throne, one hand under the other, ready to receive our great King. Beautiful words, which also serve to remind us of the reverence that's needed when receiving the sacrament. Because as Catholics, we believe that Jesus Christ is truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity, in the Eucharist. We express our reverence first with a simple bow of the head as we approach the minister to receive communion. Now, that's not a full-body bow, nor a genuflection or curtsy, but it should be more than just a perfunctory motion. And be careful not to get too close before you bow either. Many people make the simple bow when they are next in line for communion. Now, having the appropriate reverence for the Eucharist also translates into some practical considerations when it comes to actually receiving the Blessed Sacrament. If you hold your hands like a trap door, there's likely to be an accident. If you have other stuff in your hand, how much room is there for Jesus? And if your hands are not clean, well, it's probably best to go ahead and receive on the tongue that day. And when receiving on the tongue, try not to make it difficult for the communion minister to place it there. You really need to open your mouth and stick out your tongue. And when receiving the precious blood of Jesus from the cup minister, take the cup in your hands and drink as you normally would. Like most public prayer in our church, the communion rite, as it is called, is really a dialogue of prayer. There are words exchanged between you and the priest or deacon or other extraordinary minister of Holy Communion. They're simple words, but they are important. The body of Christ. Amen. Now there's a reason we respond with the word amen and not some other thing. Thank you. Cool. Amen is a word that has different meanings intentionally. When we say amen, it means literally truly or yes or indeed. 
When the minister says the body of Christ, we say, Amen. Yes, I believe that truly is the body of Christ. But we're also saying, Amen. Yes, I am a member of the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And we also say, Amen. I will take Jesus into my heart, into my life this week. Amen. 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 You may be nervous if it's your first time or if it's been a while, but don't forget to say amen. Again. So uh, between Father Doug, Father Jorge, and I, we have a lot of different uh, names for the different ways in which people receive communion. Uh, we have the clamshell. <laughs> we have the Great Wall of China. We have uh, horse lips. It's a lot of lip movement and like that. Trying to trying to get the Eucharist from the lips uh, from the the fingers of the priest. Uh, that's where we get the most trouble is when someone's trying to put their lips around your finger. That's it's not a pleasant experience. Uh, you've got the coin slot where they just kind of go like that. You kind of have to get it in there. You you hope that you play some music like on the jukebox. Uh, if you receive on the hand. Again, the way St. Cyril of uh, Jerusalem wrote from the 300s, one hand on top of the other and reverently receive therefore. However, if you receive on the hand, it is of the utmost importance. It is the, of the utmost importance. And once again, it is of the utmost importance. Make sure that there are no particles on your hands. Why do I say this? As my dad explained in the story a little bit earlier, every, every particle of the Eucharist is the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If we have particles and receive and then go like that, or like that, where do the particles go? All over the floor. They go all over the floor. There's a, there's a very popular uh, uh, reality show that I've seen on, on what used to be the History Channel at this point. Um, it's called Gold Diggers, and so they go to all these different countries, Canada, Australia, and they follow the lives of these gold miners who spend millions and millions of dollars looking for the smallest speck of gold. They get super excited when in a bucket full of dirt, there's like one or two flecks of gold. You can't contain the, the, the excitement that they feel at seeing those little flecks. If that is how people treat a essentially uh, a fleck of gold that is lost in the wind, how much therefore should we be excited and take great care of the particles of the Eucharist, of the particles of our blessed Lord's body and blood. Again, our Lord knew the, the risk that he took when instituting this most beautiful sacrament. Our Lord knew that there would be times where he would fall, that there would be times where he might even be stepped on. He knew that that would be the case. But out of his great love, he gave this gift to us anyway. And if he therefore loves us so much to place himself in such a vulnerable position to make sure that we could receive physically our Lord and Savior, it is therefore of the utmost importance, of the utmost importance, of the utmost importance that we take the time and the effort to make sure that we reverence, that we protect, and that we worship every particle of that holy host. Most of you, uh, if you have come to receive a communion from me in line, uh, most of you, a lot of you will notice that when I pick up a host, I'll usually shake it off a little bit before I offer it. This is to make sure that no particle of our Lord is lost, that no particle of our Lord ends up on the floor where we will trample, where we will step on, where we will cause hurt to our Lord physically. If you receive on the tongue, do not be afraid to stick your tongue out at the priest. If he's a priest that you don't like, use that opportunity. Do it. I'm begging you. Please. 
Open your mouth wide. Stick out your tongue. Offer an altar with your body where the priest can place our Lord reverently and gently within your body. If you receive on the tongue, I know we want to have our hands like this in order to show that we are praying and that we are worshiping our Lord. But this gets in the way. If you receive on the tongue, either have them lower or when the way I do it when I'm at a Mass and I'm not concelebrating, I will physically put my hands behind my back so that when I bow and when I extend my tongue to the priest, there is nothing obstructing him. There is no obstacle that might get in the way between Christ and myself. So therefore, my friends, that is just a short, a very short explanation of why we believe in the Eucharist, how we believe in the Eucharist, and how we worship and receive the Eucharist. This uh, particular uh, topic, very much like how my dad was explaining, you could easily go into days and full weeks of workshops and talks just about this topic. But sadly, we don't have that kind of time. I hope at the very least that with the talk that my dad gave at the beginning and this short little talk that I've offered to you all, that if you gain even just one new bit of knowledge, into understanding our Catholic faith, into understanding that we, as a Catholic Church, are given the sole privilege of having our Lord not only spiritually, as do our Protestant brothers and sisters, but that we have the opportunity to say, I know where my God is. He is waiting for me in the tabernacle of my local parish, at every Mass, when I receive Him, I have Him physically and spiritually with me at that time. My friends, this gift of being able to physically be present before our God here in this world, it is a preparation for us to be able to share eternity with God in heaven the way that we worship, the way that we love, the way that pre we prepare ourselves for Mass, that is all a preparation for how we will be able to present ourselves before the Lord when it is our time to stand before His throne of judgment and at the end of times when there is the resurrection of the body, we will be reunited spiritually and physically before our Lord and if we open our hearts to God's love and mercy, if we open our hearts and our bodies to receiving Christ here in this world, we will have that reception, we will have that reality in its perfect totality in heaven for all eternity. Everything we do here is just a preparation for what is awaiting us. But some preparations are more important than others how we approach Mass, how we approach the Eucharist, and how we receive the Eucharist. This is the most important preparation for us as a Christian people. And so now, my friends, uh, we'll take about 10, 15 minutes, if you all need to get up, stretch out, move around, and immediately afterwards, we'll go into the teaching Mass where, step by step, I will explain what it is we are doing why it is we are doing it, why it is that we are doing it, and how best to get the greatest amount of uh, uh, worship and the greatest amount of love from our God and how we can best show our love and worship for Christ. So for right now, that's the end of the talk. I'm sure you're all very excited. <laughs> so you all can get up, stretch around. Don't eat any chips. If you plan on receiving communion, you can drink as much water as needed. That's okay, but the chips for right now, if you're going to receive communion, don't, don't eat any. All right, so let's take 10, 15, and we'll be right back.
Are there two brave souls who would be willing to read the first and second reading? Anybody? All right, that's one. And, all right, and that's two. Excellent. So if you all want to come up, uh, be ready, go over it once. Uh, so this, this Mass, we're not going to be doing any, uh, any singing, so there's no, there's no pressure on that point. Um, we've got a lot to go through, so... <laughs> First reading, whoever does the first reading, uh, just the responsible one will Okay? But you just have to say it, you don't have to sing it. Who, who's, who's doing the first reading? Okay? okay. So you know, you know how that goes? Okay. So you'll say that once, and then allow us to repeat, and then you read that, allow us to repeat that, yeah. So then, second reading, and then, and then I'll take care of the gospel. Okay. Are you going to read this section? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Try to keep everything on this. Yeah. Go ahead.
Blessed be God the Father and the only begotten Son of God, and also the Holy Spirit, for he has shown us his merciful love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The sign of the cross is how we begin our worship in the Holy Mass. The sign of the cross is not only a way to begin prayers, but the sign of the cross is in and of itself already a powerful prayer. In the use of the sign of the cross, we cover our entire selves, we cover our entire bodies, asking and calling upon the divine power and protection of the Most Holy Trinity. The early Christians saw the sign of the cross as a way of demarcating God's faithful people. It was the way in which you knew that someone was a true believer in Jesus Christ. St. John Chrysostom in the 300s wrote about the importance of how the sign of the Holy Cross helps souls fight temptations, protects them from evil, and even brings terror to demons. St. John Chrysostom writes, Never leave your house without making the sign of the cross. Let this sign teach you that you are a soldier ready to combat against the demons and ready to fight for the crown. Of justice. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Even here now, this is of the utmost importance. We hear all throughout the scriptures in how the Lord, when he reveals himself either through his holy angels or he himself physically and literally appears before the holy prophets and apostles. The Lord throughout the Bible says to those who are to receive an important message, he says to those who are to in, uh, undertake an important mission, the Lord be with you. It is heard by the prophets and patriarchs as they are again to receive a special mission from God. The way that you all respond and with your spirit back to the priest, back to the one who is offering the Holy Mass, you are recognizing the reality that through the Holy Spirit's power, through the share of Christ's priesthood that the priest does have, there is a unique activity that is at work in the hands and in the words that the priest speaks. Uh, it is therefore of the utmost importance for you all to pray for us priests that we would be able and willing to guide you all as you deserve, that we would be able and willing to bring forth the Lord to you as God himself desires. My brothers and sisters, let us therefore acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask the Blessed Mary, ever virgin, all the angels and saints, and to you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Here, as we recognize the reality that because of our human weakness, because of our human pride and greed, we are in truth unworthy of approaching the Lord. But... If we have a contrite heart, if we repent of our evil ways, the Lord provides for us time and time again, every hour of every day, the opportunity to return once more to Him. Here we pray in a special way that we recognize it is through our fault, through our fault, through our most grievous fault. We say this three times, recognizing the reality that each and every sin that we commit against God, against our brothers and sisters, and against ourselves, it is of the utmost importance. Sin is no small matter. 
And so we remind ourselves again and again and again of how grievous it is. And yet even through our grievous faults, the Lord is still able through his threefold mercy in where we pray, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. His mercy is greater than our most grievous sin. His mercy is able to overtake our most grievous sin. Therefore, in the threefold perfection of Christ's mercy, no sin, if we entrust it to God, could ever keep us away from Him. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, Heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, Only Begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, You take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world. Receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Have mercy on us. For You alone are the Holy One, You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ. With the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. God, our Father, who by sending into the world the word of truth and the spirit of sanctification made known to the human race your wondrous mystery, grant us, we pray, that in professing the true faith, we may acknowledge the trinity of eternal glory and adore your unity, powerful in majesty. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Please be seated. And so the Gloria and the opening collect, we change from the sorrow of, of proclaiming to the Lord that it is through our fault, through our fault, through our most grievous fault, that we have separated ourselves from him. And yet, in the Gloria, we change from sorrow into joy. We chant the Gloria as did the angels themselves above Bethlehem in Luke chapter 2, where the angels proclaim the majesty of Christ, the God-made man. He enters into the world. And so because of this perfect unification between the spirit and the earthly, The angels themselves cannot withhold the joy that they experience. The angels themselves cannot withhold the majesty of what is happening. So we share alongside the angels the opportunity and the ability to proclaim to God glory on high. And so in the opening collect, together as a Christian people, the opening collect combines the intercessions and the needs of the people of God and places them before our Heavenly Father, that we would remember that here at Mass, the Lord desires to complete our needs, both spiritual and physical, in His own way and in His own perfect time. The Collect, therefore, combines all of our hearts, minds, and souls together as one people, bringing our needs and intentions to the Heavenly Father. Now we will enter into the Liturgy of the Word, where we will hear the first reading from the Old Testament, a responsorial psalm, the second reading from one of the epistles, and the Gospel from one of the Gospels. Sacred Scripture leads us to a deeper communion with Christ. Sacred Scripture does not only talk about God, But we as a Catholic people hold and believe that sacred scripture is God's own word being spoken to us. Anytime we hear the words from the Holy Bible, we are not, again, only hearing about God, but we are literally hearing God's own words being shared with us once more in this earthly life. At the end, we say thanks be to God as we are invited to understand how marvelous it is for us in this world 
to hear God speak to us through the Scriptures. And so we say this at the end of the first reading and at the end of the second reading. In between, we have the responsorial psalms. The psalms, are, uh, the recitation of the psalms of King David are meant to allow us a time to enter into a meditative environment in which we are more able to consider what we have heard in the first reading and what we will later hear in the second reading and in the gospel. This reality of in the responsorial psalm, the cantor first begins and then the congregation responds. This reality of call and response in prayer is seen in Exodus chapter 19 and then ultimately the heavenly angels and the heavenly creatures call and respond to each other in the, in the kingdom of heaven in Revelation chapter 5. This reality of call and response, we encounter it all the time in our daily lives. When someone says something with which we agree, oftentimes we'll chime in and say, yeah, that's right, or I totally agree with you in that. When we hear the words from the responsorial psalm and respond with those same exact words, it is as if we are saying within our heart and soul, that which is being preached to us, we do wholeheartedly believe. That which we hear, we hold within the depths of our heart, and we share that same reality with the world and with our brothers and sisters around us. And so, after the first reading, the responsorial psalm, the second reading, comes the gospel. It is from the gospels that we have a most basic understanding of who Christ is. It is within the, uh, the stories and events of the Gospels that we know of Christ as Son of God and as God made man. For this reason, the Gospels, out of all the books of the Bible, hold a primacy of place. It is for this reason that when the Gospel is read, we no longer remain seated but we stand at attention, ready to hear the Word of God, ready to stand and fight for the Word of God. And so now, uh, together as a people of God, we will hear the Word of God being preached to us once more in this world. The Solemnity of the Most Holy Trinity, first reading. Before the earth was made, wisdom was conceived. This is a reading from the book of Proverbs. Thus says the wisdom of God. The Lord possessed me, the beginning of his ways, the forerunner of his prodigies of long ago. From of old I was poured forth, at the first before the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth when there were no fountains or springs of water, before the mountains were settled into place, before the hills I was brought forth, while as yet the earth and fields were not made, nor the first clods of the world. When the Lord established the heavens, I was there, when he marked out the vault over the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he fixed fast the fountains of foundations of the earth, when he set for the sea its limit, so that the waters should not transgress his command. Then was I beside him as his craftsman, and I was his delight day by day, playing before him all the while, playing on the surface of his earth, and I found delight in the human race. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. O Lord our God, how wonderful your name in all the earth. O Lord, o Lord our God, how wonderful your name in all the earth. When I behold your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, 
which you set in place. What is man that you should be mindful of him, or the son of man that you should care for him? O Lord our God, how wonderful your name in all the earth. You have made him little less than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him rule over the works of your hands, putting all things under his feet. O oh Lord our God, how wonderful your name in all the earth. All sheep and oxen, yes, the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fishes of the sea, and whatever swims the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our God, how wonderful your name in all the earth. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith to his grace in which we stand, and we boast in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we even boast of our afflictions, knowing that affliction produces endurance, and endurance proven character and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said to his disciples, I have much more to tell you, but you cannot bear it now. But when he comes, the Spirit of truth, he will guide you to all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will speak what he hears and will declare to you the things that are coming. He will glorify me because he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. Everything that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I told you that he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. The Gospel of the Lord. And so even before the reading of the Gospel, I say unto all of you, the Lord be with you. Again, because we are hearing the direct words of Christ himself, and through his words and example we are receiving our most holy assignment, our most holy mission of bringing the word of Christ into the world again through how we ourselves speak and of how we ourselves uh, emulate Christ's action in the world. At this point in time, usually after the gospel, there comes the homily. The homily, homily in and of itself, the word comes from the Greek word to mean explanation. This reality of reading the Word of God and then having uh, one of the leaders of the community explain the deeper meaning of what God is trying to share with His people. This comes to us all the way from the Old Testament. The Levites would help the people understand what God wanted from them in their lives after proclaiming the law. And we can find examples of that in Nehemiah chapter 8. This particular practice of reading the Word of God and having someone expound upon it is was a common practice and remains a common practice, not only among us as a Christian people, but from the time of the Jewish synagogues. And if you visit a Jewish synagogue even today, they continue this practice from ancient times. We know that Christ himself partook of this particular uh, practice. We can read it in Luke chapter 4 and in the first chapter of Mark. We find Christ in the synagogues after he reads 
from the prophets and from the law of Moses. And he explains to the people that he is the final and most perfect revelation of God among the people. His word was final. His word was the ultimate truth of behind what God desires for his people to hear. And so here, usually, I would offer a homily, but considering that the whole Mass is going to be my homily, we're going to keep moving on, uh, keep moving on forward. to the creed. The creed is our basic summary of the faith that was used ever since the early years of the church. It was used as the standard of Christian belief, and those who entered into the church would take in the creed and, and uh, uh, declare their belief in every aspect of the creed. So today, as a people of God, we pray, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, made for heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came out from heaven. And by the Holy Spirit, he was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified on the conscious life. He suffered death with Mary and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and dead. And the kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, and is spoken from the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess some baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The creed, if we notice, encapsulates the entirety of the human experience. We speak firstly of how God, in his infinite love and wisdom, creates everything in the world. We then hear of how Christ comes in order to redeem the world from its sin and death, and to be the place of us, rather that he dies for us, that we would receive eternal life. The creed then moves on into what we hope for in the future, that God will come to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. The creed, therefore, encapsulates the past, the present, and the future, everything that we believe and hold as a Catholic Christian people. We now enter into the prayers of the faithful, and this particular practice of bringing the needs of the people before God is attested to by St. Justin Martyr. St. Justin Martyr wrote out a description of the Mass in the year 155, even before St. Ignatius of Antioch, who we spoke of uh, earlier. We are exhorted by St. Paul, even in Scripture, to offer prayer and intercession for ourselves and others. We are told this in 1 Timothy chapter 2 to pray for the good of our communities, nations, and our leaders, that we may be in a quiet and peaceable life, goodly and respectful in every way. Therefore, holding to this reality, we bring before the Holy Trinity the, our needs and petitions. For the Church and the body of Christ in all the world, and for all who have been called to serve, that the unity of God would be a continued source of inspiration and wisdom. We pray to the Lord. For all gathered here today, that in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we would remain faithful to our calling to proclaim the good news with our lives. We pray to the Lord. For all leaders of countries and nations, that they may labor to 
that they might receive the grace of God needed to reflect the Trinity's communion and love. We pray to the Lord. Lord For peace around the world, especially in areas that experience the daily devastation of war, for peace in the Middle East and in Ukraine and Russia, for an end to violence in our communities, towns, and schools, we pray to the Lord. For all who are facing death, that they may find comfort in the love of God who calls them home. We pray to the Lord. We pray especially for Megan Rushi. We pray to the Lord. And because today this Mass is a special Mass, uh, I forgot to uh, put down any specific name for any specific person for whom this Mass would be offered. So here today, if you would so desire, you have the opportunity to voice your needs and petitions uh, for us as a community to pray alongside you. I bring before the Lord and before you, my brothers and sisters, that we would offer this Mass in a special way for all those in holy and all the holy souls of everyone, that they would soon enter into the eternal kingdom of God. We pray to the Lord. Good and Holy Father, we bring these needs and petitions before you, trusting that you hear and answer them according to your divine will. We ask all these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. And so now we enter into the second part of the Mass. The first part of the Mass is known as the Liturgy of the Word. And so now we enter into the Liturgy of the Eucharist. This is the central part of the Mass and the most important out of the two. For this reason, we uh, do what is often uh, called as Catholic calisthenics, where we stand and sit and kneel and stand again and kneel and sit and all this. We're moving a lot. There's a lot of movement because there is so much happening in this time during the Mass that one specific Uh, position of our bodies is not enough to encapsulate the reality of what is going on. We offer in this part of the Mass the different ways of worshiping and receiving our Lord in sitting and standing and kneeling. It's almost as if in our bodies we are so excited about what is happening that we can't contain ourselves. We can't keep still. If you've ever seen a small child that is about to receive a a particular gift or get to go somewhere that they really want to go, their little bodies, they can't hold it all in. They get all excited. They're moving around. They're jumping, screaming perhaps. Please don't scream during that. but, uh, But the reality of this kind of joy, it is what we exhibit in the different ways that we offer worship to God in sitting, in standing, in kneeling. All of this works together to really proclaim the joy of what we hope to receive, to really proclaim the reality of what is happening here at the altar. The first part then would normally be the offering of the bread and the wine, where uh, a couple or a family bring with them the gift of bread and wine from the community. This offering of bread and wine in worship of God As my dad mentioned earlier, it comes to us from the Old Testament. Firstly, with uh, Abraham uh, and Melchizedek, where Abraham, because of his victories and success that he receives from the hand of God, he brings bread and wine to the priest Melchizedek. That Melchizedek would offer this humble uh, bread and wine on behalf of Abraham to the glory and worship of God. We also read of it in Exodus 29 with Moses and the Israelites and Leviticus in chapter 2, chapter 7, and chapter 23. The offering of bread and wine is central to the Jewish expression of faith. The offering of bread and wine, because at this time in the world, bread and wine were the core elements of their diet this small offering of what is most central for life, what is most central to keep them thriving through the harsh uh, 
elements of their world through the harsh elements of the Middle East. This small offering therefore shows in their offering of bread and wine, Lord, although this is what is necessary for our earthly lives, we offer it back to you that you would fill us even more abundantly spiritually. We offer you these physical elements of bread and wine that we in our hearts and souls would be spiritually filled and spiritually nourished. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. So here now, uh, especially with the offering of uh, the wine, many of you will notice that at every Mass, the priest puts in just a few drops of water into the wine. This is so that we can recall physically in a, in a literal way the fact that from the side of Christ after he was stabbed with a lance through the chest what pours out from our Lord is blood and water. It is from the blood and water that the Lord uh, pours forth from his side. It is by that blood and water that the entire world is cleansed. The entire world is purified by that, by that blood and water of all its sin, of all its death, and of all its faults. Here too now, we take a special care of commemorating that reality physically in the chalice. Also, there is the understanding that the wine is meant to represent the divinity of Christ, and the water is meant to represent his humanity. In his humanity, Christ therefore stands in the place of all of us, all of his brothers and sisters throughout the world. This water, therefore, as it stands for our own humanity, this water, when it is poured into the wine, Christ, in his perfect divinity, takes up his humanity and he takes up our own humanity. He takes it up and envelops it in such a way that the water is no longer distinguishable from the wine. The water in these few drops becomes wine. And so in the way that God in his divinity becomes human, we in our sharing of his divinity, we in our humanity therefore are given the opportunity to become divine. We in our humanity are taken up entirely by Christ and made much more than what we ourselves can make ourselves. Christ, in his divinity, envelops us in such a way that our humanity is stripped of its faults and becomes the divinity that the Lord desires for us. Here now, after having offered the bread and the wine, the priest washes his hands. Again, this reality comes to us from the Old Testament. As my dad again explained earlier today, for a priest to approach God in the Ark of the Covenant, for a priest to approach God in the temple in Jerusalem, he had to make sure that he was clean spiritually and physically we hear we hear firstly the reality that let's see hold on lost my place here ancient israel in the old covenant of ancient israel all the priests and levites had to undergo ritual 
purification in order to worthily participate in the holy work. We read it in Exodus 29, Exodus 30, and in Numbers 8. Psalm 24, one of the hymns written by King David, mentions the essential connection between clean, pure, innocent hands and a clean, pure, and innocent heart. It is only those who have both who can ascend the holy mountain of God. And so it is from this reality coming to us all the way from the Old Testament that we nowadays, in our own day and age, have the uh, idiom, cleanliness is next to godliness. That's not something that OCD people came up with. It is a reality that comes to us from the most ancient of times. And so when the priest is purifying his hands as he is offering the bread and wine, it is a symbol, it is a uh, reflection that he is entering into a holy and divine work. He is entering into a work where he must make sure that physically and spiritually he is cleansed and able to share in the divinity of God, that he is able to share in the love and mercy that God is about to enact in the world. Pray now, my brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Sanctified by the invocation of your name, we pray, O Lord our God, this oblation of our service, and by it make of us an eternal offering to you, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Again, my friends, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For with your only begotten Son and the Holy Spirit, you are one God, one Lord, not in the unity of a single person, but in a trinity of one substance. For what you have revealed to us of your glory, we believe equally of your Son and of the Holy Spirit, so that in the confessing of the true and eternal Godhead, you might be adored in what is proper to each person their unity in substance, and their equality in majesty. For this is praised by angels and archangels, cherubim too and seraphim, who never cease to cry out each day, as with one voice they acclaim, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And so in the Eucharistic prayer, the Eucharistic prayer is divided into three parts that come to us from the Jewish tradition. We praise God for His work in the past. We give Him thanksgiving for His redemptive work. And we pray for the future, for what the future holds in God's hands, that He would continue to work His saving grace through our lives and through the lives of our family and friends. When we sing the Holy, 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 we are singing the same words that the prophet Isaiah hears in God's heavenly court. The angels themselves proclaim Holy, Holy, Holy to the Lord in Isaiah chapter 6. By repeatedly calling God Holy, 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 the angels proclaim God as the holiest one in existence by proclaiming again this reality that God is holy, not once, not twice, but three times. Again, God is worshipped as being the most holy being in all the universe. This reality is not only experienced then by the prophet Isaiah, but also by St. John in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 4, St. John sees the six-winged seraphim praising Christ, singing, Holy, Holy, Holy. 
Therefore, when we ourselves proclaim God as holy, 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 we are, we are mystically entering into God's heavenly kingdom and we are sharing with our own voice the eternal praise of the angelic beings. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At this moment, where I place my hands over the, the bread and wine, asking that the Holy Spirit be present to change these earthly elements into, into the divine body, of, body and blood of Jesus Christ, this is known as the epiclesis. This moment of the Mass where the priest asks that the Holy Spirit be present is exactly the same as when St. Gabriel announces to the Virgin Mary that the Holy Spirit is present and makes God physically present in the Virgin Mary's womb. This moment of invocation by the Holy Spirit is equivalent to the incarnation of Christ in His humanity. As the Holy Virgin Mary receives Christ physically and bodily in her womb, so now we ask that the Holy Spirit would change these merely earthly elements into that same body and blood of Christ that was in the womb of the Virgin Mary. At the time he was betrayed, he entered willingly into his passion. He took bread and giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this all of you and eat of it for this is my body which will be given up for you In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. My friends, now, as I have been given the privilege to share in Christ's priesthood, in Christ's divine ministry, by the very words that Christ himself spoke, I, through my ordination, have the privilege and the responsibility of speaking those same exact words of Christ, those words that he spoke 2,000 years ago. What once was just a few moments ago, merely bread and merely wine, they are now transubstantiated into the body and blood of Christ. It is for that reason that at those moments I lift up the body of Christ and I lift up the chalice of his blood that we would take a moment to recognize and worship Christ who is now physically present among us. That we would take a moment to recognize that this moment of the Mass from this moment of the Mass, everything has changed. Nothing can remain the same because God is here, present among us. We now proclaim the mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection 
until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis our Pope, Richard our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the Blessed Apostles and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, and with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Even here at the end of the Eucharistic prayer, as my father mentioned earlier, wherever Christ is present, so God the Father and God the Holy Spirit is present as well. When we pray through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Although physically present is Jesus Christ, there is never ever any separation between the three. Wherever one of them is, because of the divine love that is experienced between God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, because of the divine union that is perfect in its divinity, wherever one of them is, so are the other two. And so we recognize the fact that here present at the altar, we are, we are in the midst of and enveloped by the entire Trinity especially today as we worship and offer thanksgiving in a special way on the solemnity of the Holy Trinity. It is the most beautiful moment that we share here together. It is the most beautiful moment here that we share with God among us. We now will enter into the Our Father. The Our Father, which is the most perfect prayer given to us because it is the prayer that Christ himself gave his people. The Our Father is divided up into seven separate petitions, the first three of which are petitions in which we desire to become closer and more connected to God the Father. And in the final four petitions, we pray for the needs that we experience in our daily lives, and we pray for the needs of our brothers and sisters throughout the entire world, that as a church, as a family of God, that no one would ever be left behind, either spiritually or in physical need. That as we receive from God the Father, so we would therefore be willing to share with our brothers and sisters that same love and compassion. At the Savior's command, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. After the Our Father, we pray to the Lord that he would bring peace to us, to our church, and to our world. The peace that we pray for is not simply a superficial, earthly peace, where much of the time the most that we can hope for is 
an end to fighting, an end of war at the baseline, oftentimes we can't even achieve that kind of peace, humanly speaking. The kind of peace that we pray for from God is a peace that is altogether far above what we could ever hope for. It is a divine peace. It is a true, everlasting peace. The priest prays, deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. The kind of peace that we are seeking is known in Hebrew as shalom. It is, in fact, actually here in our own beautiful church of all saints, the word shalom is written above the entry doors as you exit that as you have received the peace of Christ, so you would bring that peace out into the world. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace, I leave you. My peace, I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us offer each other the sign of that peace. The offering of the sign of peace comes to us from Saints Peter and Saint Paul. St. Paul and St. Peter wrote to the communities of, of Christians, writing to them and exhorting them to share among themselves the peace that God has given them, to share among themselves the, the uh, mercy and compassion that Christ offers them, to share that amongst each other as brothers and sisters. We hear it in Romans 16, 1 Corinthians 16, 2 Corinthians 13, 1 Thessalonians 5, and the first uh, letter of St. Peter, chapter 5. The peace that we receive is therefore not only to be stagnant and remain with us, but it is meant to reach out to every relationship of ours, to reach out to every family and friend that we have. Lamb of God, Here at the Lamb of God, many of you will notice that I break off a small piece of my main celebrant host in order to place a small piece in the chalice of blood. This particular act is known as the co-mingling. At the beginning of the Eucharistic liturgy, at the beginning of the liturgy of the Eucharist, the separate consecration of the bread into the body of Christ and of the wine into the blood of Christ. This is meant to signify how upon the cross our Lord was completely drained of all blood. There was a separation on the cross for the cleansing of the world between Christ's body and his blood. For a sacrifice to be perfect, there had to be no blood found within the body of the Lamb. And so it was with our Lord upon the cross. At the moment of the commingling, it is meant to recall within our minds the fact that we no longer worship a God who is dead, but at the resurrection, our Lord received once more three days afterwards in the tomb the completeness of his body and soul, the completeness of the unity found within his body and blood. At the commingling, where I place a small piece of the host into the blood once more, we are called to remember that our Lord is risen. We are called to remember that our Lord is in heaven, not only in his divinity, but completely 
and totally in the unity of his body and blood. We're almost there. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold Him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Together as a community, we share in the same words as the Roman centurion whose servant was sick. He went to Christ, bringing to him the petition that he would heal his servant. Christ says, I will go to your house to heal your servant. The Roman centurion therefore responds, Lord, I am not worthy that you would enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my servant will be healed. This reality we therefore once again exclaim, as we said at the beginning, where we recognized our great fault. Here, even before we receive communion, we recognize the reality that again and again, through our sin, we are unworthy of Christ. And yet, He loves us regardless. And yet, so long as we place our sins before Him in confession and within our hearts, if we offer to God again, Lord, I've fallen. Use this opportunity to lift me back up. Use this oppor opportunity to unite me once more to you. Although again and again we pray that we are not worthy, and we fully recognize that, yet we recognize the fact of how much more the Lord desires to enter under the roof of our mouth. The Lord desires to enter into our very bodies and souls.
Let us pray. May receiving this sacrament, O Lord our God, bring us health of body and soul as we confess your eternal Holy Trinity in undivided unity through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so just before we end, notice again that the final words of the Mass are the Lord be with you. The same words that we began the Mass with. And so from the beginning to the end, there's a kind of rhythm, there's a kind of rhyming found within the Mass. As we entered in to receive from our Lord the mission of receiving him in the church now at the end of mass where you receive once again the, the calling that the Lord would be with you you are now called to bring out into the world that mission of love and hope the mission of sharing the truth of salvation found within our holy catholic church the truth of salvation through the holy sacraments of baptism confession anointing of the sick matrimony uh, ordination, you all, you know all the other ones, but most importantly, salvation through the Eucharist, salvation through the literal, physical presentation of Christ to us in our hearts and literally within our bodies. And so as my dad explained earlier, the old Latin words that would conclude the Mass were it, ite misa est go forth, it is accomplished. You are to take what you have received here. You are to be as Christ in the world and as you contain our Lord bodily for the next half hour or so, you are to be as a procession of Christ. You are to be as a representation of the Holy Catholic Church throughout the world. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. St. Michael, the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wicked.
Thank you all for being here. I hope that this was of some help. I hope that you all were able to learn something to bring into the rest of your lives, to bring into the rest of your relationship with God and your brothers and sisters in our own That's all she wants.